Welcome, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Helen Cullia. I'm the executive director of SCS. And I have to begin, unfortunately, with some sad news. Matthew Santarocco has had a death in the family and is unable to attend tonight. I would like to thank him for spending so much time organizing this event with us. Matthew will remain involved as we solicit longer versions of tonight's presentations for publication. I would also like to thank Maura Pollard of the Center for Ancient Studies for working closely with me and Shireen Ali and Eric Schell on this event. And I'd also like to thank ISOR and the Classics Department and the College of Arts and Science at NYU for their support. We are here this evening because on November 13th, 1868, 150 years ago, a group of scholars met at New York University in the chapel and approved a resolution to create a new organization, the American Philological Association. The APA held its first convention in Poughkeepsie in the summer of 1869 and published the first volume of Transactions and Proceedings that same year. They didn't waste any time. The vision was expansive and ambitious. The founders considered how should ancient and modern languages be taught? How could Native American languages be preserved? How could philological knowledge and linguistic knowledge be advanced across institutions, across languages, times, and cultures? Professor George F. Comfort, in his address at the 1868 meeting, explicitly stated that the association should embrace in its scope the whole field of philological investigation and instruction. Now, of course, this was a time before the creation of the Modern Language Association and the Linguistic Society of America. And of course, over the years, disciplines and departments formed and fragmented, and new scholarly societies were founded. The APA over time became an organization devoted to the philology of the ancient Mediterranean and of especially of Latin and Greek. In the 20th century, the APA's focus on classical studies grew to encompass more than philology. It now includes literary studies and ancient history from the Bronze Age to late antiquity. And we welcome in an increasingly interdisciplinary field, performance and performance studies, reception, digital humanities, and there's an increasing focus on the study of material culture and the materiality of text. And so in 2014, after completion of a capital campaign and some strategic planning, the organization changed its name legally to the Society for Classical Studies, a reflection not that philology has been abandoned, but rather that now we encompass other areas and methods under a broad rubric. Our membership voted for the name change, but the change was not, of course, uncontroversial. Those debates about what an organization could be called and its relationship to a rich field of study are, I think, testament to the vitality of our members' work and intellectual engagement. Those debates are a positive sign. Throughout the many changes in our field in this organization, New York and its institutions and individuals have been at many points an anchor. The APA's central office has been housed at Columbia, under Secretary and Treasurer Roger Bagnall at Fordham, under Secretary and Treasurer Harry Evans, and at NYU under the executive directorship of John Marin Kohler in the 90s and since 2016, after a very happy year, 17 years at Penn, under leadership of Adam Blistein at NYU again. And New York has played a central role in the development of the field. Tonight, our speakers will take you on a whirlwind tour through the history of classics in New York, and we hope that will stimulate reflection about the past, but also ultimately about the future. What might the broad field of study in which we are engaged be in 20, 50, or 150 years? What will this organization even be called in 150 years? Adam Blistein is laughing. <laughs> Tonight's short event can in no way be comprehensive. Um, we cannot encompass even all activities within the New York area, and we also don't want to suggest that New York is in some way the center of classics. It's a center, not the center. We're delighted to be holding our 150th meeting, annual meeting, on the West Coast in San Diego. But New York is an interesting lens through which to reflect on the past, and tonight provides us an opportunity to thank all the New York-based individuals and institutions that have supported this organization and the field through the years. 
Thank you for joining us this evening. I hope this event will inaugurate over a year of sesquicentennial events and publications that are celebratory, but not self-congratulatory. That we look forward as well as back and that we look outwards in order to engage broader audience, audiences and also inwards to self-reflection on the structures and systems inherent in our own field. In the next 150 years, may we build on the successes of the past, but strive even harder to build a field that's more inclusive, that's self-critical regarding past and current practices. Let's speak out, as many classicists are doing, about the appropriation of classics by groups that traffic in hate, particularly white supremacist groups. And let's continue to advocate vocally and even more vocally for the study, for the importance of the study of antiquity, its histories, its language, its cultures, its material culture, and its literature. Thank you very much for coming tonight, and I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Ward Briggs. Okay, well, Ward is uh, pulling up his presentation. I will just introduce him briefly. Ward Briggs is Carolina Distinguished Professor of Classics and Louise Fry Scudder Professor of Humanities Emeritus at the University of South Carolina. His early work was on Virgil, and he edited Virgilius for 10 years. Maintaining his interest in Virgil, he subsequently turned his attention to the history of classical scholarship, particularly American. He has edited the letters and papers of Basil Gildersleeve, and now his biography his biographical dictionary of North American classicists has morphed into the online database of classical scholarship, and it's currently approaching 900 entries. Thank you very much, and thank you all for, for coming, and greetings from the South, where it is exactly as cold and wet as it is here, unfortunately. Um, New York has been the home to all manner of pioneers, and for this occasion, I've been asked to discuss not the greatest classical scholars who lived or worked in New York, but only those who were true pioneers, who may not have been the best at what they did, but they managed to be the first in their fields to do it. Our story properly begins in the third, excuse me, in the third decade of our nation's history. American classical education had changed little from the colonial days. As late as 1840, de Tocqueville wrote, almost all important English books are republished in the United States. The literary genius of Great Britain still darts its rays into the recesses of the forests of the New World. Indeed, the chief Latin textbook in the colonies was the Englishman Alexander Adams' 300-page 1772 Latin grammar. So standard was this book that mastery of readings in this specific book was required for admission to most American colleges until around 1830. In Greek, the 400-page Graeca Majora, along with its little brother, the Graeca Minora, at a mere 300 pages, were out-of-context compilations of brief passages clipped from ancient authors to be read and memorized by grumbling students. In Germany, however, the 1797 publication of F.A. Wolf's Prolegomena to the Study of Homer changed the approach to classical literature forever. The new methods and discoveries of German scholarship drew talented Americans to Germany in 1815 and 1817, men like Robert Patton, Edward Everett, and George Bancroft, men determined to reform the reading of classics in America along these new German lines. Lacking the resources of a decent library, important manuscripts, and cooperative colleagues, Everett and Bancroft at Harvard and Patton at Middlebury and Princeton failed in their attempts to replicate the German lecture and research model so miserably that the grammar and recitation method continued for at least the next half century. Certainly the lion's share of classical achievement up to the 20th century in New York belongs to Columbia University. Its pioneering classicists established the department's early reputation for lexicography and pedagogy. Charles Anton, Columbia class of 1815, and ultimately John Jay Professor here, uh, sorry, there, uh, <coughs> recognized the value of the new German scholarship 
And having an almost native knowledge of the language, his father was a German-born uh, immigrant who became Surgeon General uh, in the Revolutionary Army. Uh, Anton translated, paraphrased, and one must say plagiarized a number of important German works. His interest was not in the higher realms of scholarship, which, as Everett and Patton discovered, were impossible in America at this stage. Anton's Columbia appointment also included a mastership in the Columbia Grammar and Preparatory School. And so he focused on books that would not only modernize but Americanize the teaching of Greek and Latin. He was often scored, especially savagely by New Englanders, for sloppy editing, numerous errors, and outright vandalism of his German and English sources. But he was undaunted. Given his prodigious output, perhaps much such faults of haste can be at least understood, if not excused. In 1824, Anton began a breathtakingly productive 40-year career in which he produced dozens of major reference works from both German and English sources and over 50 school editions of ancient texts drawing heavily on recent German editions, thus helping to propel the increasingly German basis of classical education in this country. He only stole from the best. Lamprier's Classical Dictionary, Valpi's Elements of Greek Grammar, Kuhner's Greek Grammar, Jacob's Greek Reader, Ainsworth's Latin Dictionary. He abridged Smith's multi-volume Classical Dictionary down to a school dictionary of Greek and Roman antiquities in 1846 and a new Classical Dictionary of Greek and Roman biography in 1862, which remained useful in America until the Oxford Classical Dictionary of 1849. He also began a tradition of lexicography at Columbia, making dictionaries for Americans out of Riddle and Arnold's English Latin lexicon, based on the German Latin dictionary of Charles Georges. And in 1859, he translated and edited Freund's, Wilhelm Freund's Latin dictionary, which was the basis, which would be the basis of Lewis and Short. He also translated Zump's uh, school Latin grammar. His textbook editions of ancient authors begin with Sallust in 1824 and include a paraphrase of Ernesti's orations of Cicero, Caesar's Gallic Wars, the Aeneid, Tacitus, Cicero's philosophical works, the first six books of the Iliad, Xenophon's in Abyssus, Nepos, Juvenal and Perseus, a version of the Holden's De Ophicius, and a commentary on seven plays of Euripides. All were gratefully received by teachers, and all went into multiple editions. Anton did add one major but forgotten work of original American scholarship, his compendious edition of Horace in 1830, the first editio maior by an American, whose novelty was hailed by the reviewer in the American Quarterly Review by these words, a critical edition of a classical author elaborated in America and for American consumption. That is a new thing under the sun. Anton's achievement can be summarized as follows. One, he provided America with textbooks and methods that revolutionized the teaching of classics and broke away from the static 18th century English models. Two, he brought to American shores models of German work, diluted for American students, but important foundations for the compelling interest in German classical study that would bear its most significant fruit in the successful importation of German professionalized training by the generation of William Watson Goodwin, William Dwight Whitney, and Basil L. Gildersleeve. And number three, he established at Columbia the primacy of excellent teaching a tradition carried on by his successor, Henry Drizzler, Gonzalez Lodge, and if anything, enhanced by the great teachers of the 20th century, Gilbert Hyatt, Moses Hattis, and Howard Porter, along with the historians, Elias J. Bickerman and Morton Smith. The teaching of Anton's student, Henry Drizzler, was described by his student, Nicholas Murray Butler, as, quote, dry as dust. <laughs> Drizzler is better known for his contributions in revising and expanding Little and Scott's Greek-English lexicon. He also contracted to write Harper's Latin Dictionary, an expansion of Anton's revision of Andrew's Latin-English lexicon based on William 
Wilhelm Freund's Latin German lexicon, which derived from I.J.G. Scheller's 1783 Latin German dictionary. I won't go on. Following <laughs> Anton's lead, he continued to further the German scientific approach to philology and was justifiably called America's first true lexicographer of the Greek and Latin languages. Butler had no higher regard for the teaching of Drizzler's student, Charles Lancaster Short, than he had for Drizzler. Said Butler, a pedant if ever there was one. Short was a student of the lexicographer E.A. Sophocles at Harvard. In his early career at preparatory school, sharpened his understanding of students' needs for authoritative reference books. He was an exacting scholar who, even as a boy, argued with his Andover Latin master about, the transla about a translation in class and walked 20 miles to Cambridge to find the correct translation in the Harvard Library. Short took over Drizzler's contract for the Harper's Latin Dictionary, promising to finish the job in three years. When he could not complete it, the contract was transferred to Carlton Thomas Lewis. Short may have been diverted by his may have been diverted from the dictionary work by his sacred calling to the American Committee on the Revision of the English Authorized Version of the Bible. Carlton Thomas Lewis was in fact a lawyer, not an academic with a thriving practice in New York. He uh, had trained in classics as preparation for both the law and the ministry. He managed to complete the dictionary. Short had only gotten as far as the letter D after 13 years, and subsequently extracted shorter versions of it in 1889 and 1891. The dictionary, which we all call Lewis and Short, but which is really Lewis's expansion and completion of Short's continuation of Drizzler's version of Andrew's translation of Freud's <laughs> lexicon, was the first and, last first and last compendious American Latin dictionary, the standard in the field from its publication in 1879 until the advent of the Oxford Latin Dictionary in 1982. But even today, it has to be consulted in the case of lapses in the OLD. Another student of Anton and Drizzler, Drizzler was Augustus Chapman Merriam, born in Leiden, New York, graduated from Columbia in 1866, and he spent his entire career on the faculty of his alma mater. An early interest in Homer had led to an interest in the developing fields of epigraphy and archaeology. He was thus the first American scholar to specialize in archaeology and epigraphy and was recognized as such by Columbia when he was awarded the first professorship of archaeology and epigraphy. An argument with Theodore Momsen led Merriam ultimately to write the definitive work on the Caesarean. His early death at 52 deprived the classical world of one of its true pioneers. Gonzalez Loge was a pioneer in the field of Latin teaching. To that end, he founded Classical Weekly, now Classical World, the first American periodical aimed exclusively at teachers of Latin and Greek. On a weekly basis, Lodge supplied learned articles, essays on teaching methodology and practice, and information on resources for his secondary, the secondary teacher. He edited the journal for seven years before turning it over to his colleague, Charles Knapp. With his doctor of honor, Basil Gildersleeve, he produced the Gildersleeve Lodge Latin series which was the most popular Latin series in the country between 1890 and 1930. The third edition of Gildersleeve Loge Latin Grammar was reprinted as late as 2010. <coughs> Loge told teachers to make Latin come alive by publishing Latin newspapers, speaking and writing in class about modern events in Latin, promoting conversation in Latin, adapting classroom readings to the interests or the specialties of the students. His revolutionary approach to teaching, expanded in the pages of his journal, has found its modern counterpart in the modern emphasis on oral or conversational Latin in the Cambridge Latin series, the Nature Method, and other series. Charles Knapp continued the teaching legacy at Columbia, but at the same time was renowned as the editor of Classical Weekly for 24 years and the author of over 600 articles. An 1887 graduate, he was based at Barnard, 
and associated with Columbia for over 50 years, during which time he became a legendary teacher whose school texts were widely used and who directed 14 dissertations, including those of E. Adelaide Hahn, Moses Hattis, Alice Kober, and Maya Reinhold. Not only his prodigious output, but his exemplary teaching and his two decades of editing CW made an invaluable contribution to American classics. Moving further into the 20th century, we find a seminal figure in the developing field of papyrology. In the 1920s, Yale was the center of papyrological studies, but William Lynn Westerman, officially an ancient historian, was, in the words of his student Meyer Reinhold, one of the pioneers, I got, is that him? Yes. One of the pioneers, or are you objecting? No, one of the pioneers of uh, papyrological studies. Um, in the United States. He had studied at Berlin under Villamovitz, Diels, Heinz, and many others. In addition to his important studies on slavery in Egypt and Greece and Rome, he wrote definitively on the papyri at Cornell and Columbia and the tax lists at the Adelphia, and he trained many students, the greatest of whom were Moses Finley and Naphtali Lewis. Finally, I should say that Gilbert Hyatt, in addition to his contributions, to our knowledge and understanding of Roman poetry was a pioneer in delivering classics and more importantly, presenting to the masses the model of a modern humanist, broadly read, widely recognized as the most well-known classicist in the country. Taking advantage of the media center that is New York, he paved the way for others who were not at all put off by the charge of being popular. The art of teaching is still an indispensable PN to our profession. There are, of course, many significant figures at Barnard, Fordham, Hunter, CUNY, and I would be remiss not to include our host, NYU. Among the pioneers is the aforementioned Robert Patton, who received a PhD in classics in 1821 from Göttingen, just four years after Edward Everett. Like Everett, he failed to transplant German methods to, at Middlebury and Princeton, and finally came to the city uh, to the City College of New York. He published school texts and textbooks, mainly drawn from the German, before his early death at 43. A significant figure at Brooklyn College, in the same department with the eminent papyrologist, um, the eminent papyrologist Neptali Lewis, um, won't be the subject of, my, of, of uh, uh, the address, but I just love this picture so much, and the historian Maya Reinhold, was Frederick M. Wheelock, who had written his Harvard dissertation under E.K. Rand and was thus embroiled in the Harvard Servius. But his breakthrough contribute publication was suggested by the Eliot Professor of Greek at Harvard, Carl Newell Jackson, who during Wheelock's time there had been, had been collecting samples and creating lessons for a new kind of Greek textbook, one based on readings drawn only from the ancient authors. Jackson knew that he was too ill to complete the job, so he enlisted two of his students, Alston Hurd Chase and Henry Phillips, to take up the task. Wheelock decided to do the same thing for Latin, and he produced a revolutionary textbook, employing from lesson one sentences and readings from ancient authors, which made the transition to actual ancient texts far smoother in subsequent years. This pioneering book circulated as his as his class text at Brooklyn on mimeograph sheets in the 1940s was first published in 1956 and is now in its seventh edition, ably overseen by Richard A. Lafleur. It is recognized as the most widely used college-level introductory Latin textbook of the 20th century. There are many heroes at Brooklyn College, but I want to look at a true pioneer, Alice E. Kober, Cobra received her PhD at Columbia and was at Brooklyn from 1930 to 1950. While an undergraduate at Hunter, she became interested in the seemingly impenetrable Minoan scripts Sir Arthur Evans had unearthed at Knossos. She determined to develop her own method of decipherment by studying the archaeology and language of Native Americans in New Mexico, by learning as many ancient languages as possible. She also brought the disciplines of natural science and statistics to bear on her work in order to develop a, an original method of her own that ultimately detected inflection in linear B, 
in three examples, known popularly as Kober's triplets. With Sir John Myers, she cataloged and classified the tablets and later some 1,700 Knossian documents in Oxford. With Emmett Bennett, she deciphered the metrical system after studying the Linear B tablets at Pylos. Without her work, it is doubtful that Ventress and Chapman could have successfully deciphered Linear B in 1951 to 53. Despite her contributions, she remained an assistant professor for 15 years, finally being promoted only four months before her premature death at 43. Here at NYU, Lionel Casson, who chose to be known to his friends as Jimmy, devoted 43 years of professional service to his alma mater. Like Hyatt, he felt no hesitation in aiming many of his books at a popular audience. His numerous books on aspects of the ancient world in the Horizon series won countless readers, and his Sunrise Semester course was a fixture of early New York City television. From his boyhood, he was, so oh, sorry, where's, there he is. From his boyhood, he was fascinated with sailing. And with the introduction of the Aqualung after World War II, he was able to witness great archeological discoveries from the sea floor. The ancient mariners in 1959 and ships and seamanship in the ancient world in 1971 were pioneering works based on this new evidence. His commentary on the Periplus Mari Erythrae in 1989 and travel in the ancient world in 1979 contained new information, valuable to the scholar and accessible to the amateur. We must go up the Hudson for our next pioneer, Abby Leach of Vassar. Born in Brockton, Mass., she was frustrated that the level of education offered to women was so inferior to that of men that, and she had no taste for coeducational Cornell. In 1878, she made her way to Cambridge, Mass., where she confronted the Eliot professor of Greek, William Watson Goodwin, to ask if she could take private lessons in Greek from him. Her father was a wealthy shoe manufacturer, so she could pay any fees. Um, and Goodwin uh, vaguely supported women's education at the higher level, but he told her that the logistics were just simply impossible. But Goodwin was so touched by her sudden seizure of dejection and disappointment that he thought it might, he might more easily dismiss her if, he just get, if her Greek were not up to the standard. So he gave her a passage of Xenophon and then a passage of Herodotus, both of which she translated perfectly at sight. Her performance was so impressive that he not only agreed to take her on as a student, but he also volunteered the services of the professor of Latin, James Bradstreet Grinnell, and the professor of English, Francis James Child. Soon Grace Agassiz, the daughter of the great Harvard biologist Louis Agassiz, pitched in, and in the fullness of time, President Eliot agreed to allow the classes to meet in a building at Six Appian Way in Cambridge. Those classes led to the establishment of the Annex, which led to the establishment of Radcliffe College. On the 25th commencement of Radcliffe, Radcliffe president and male, uh, LeBaron Russell Briggs, alas, no relation, um, and said of Abby Leach, no one can speak more fully at a Radcliffe commencement than she who was the commencement of Radcliffe. She made history again in 1900 when, as professor at Vassar, she was, elevated, she was elected the first woman president of the American Philological Association. There would not be another woman president until Elizabeth Hazelton Haight in 1934 and Lily Ross Taylor in 42. But the last half of the 20th century saw nine more female presidents. By contrast, the Modern Language Association, founded 15 years after the APA in 1884, did not have a female president until 1954. Time permits only one more pioneer of whom we have uh, heard already, but he's a man of whom we, uh, to whom we owe a great deal, and he is the reason we're meeting here today. George Fisk Comfort, came from a family of abolitionists, graduated from Wesleyan University in 1857 with a degree in classics, and taught languages sufficiently to earn an AM in 1860. He wisely spent the years of the Civil War in Europe, 
mostly at the University of Berlin, the Prussian Academy of Fine Arts, and the Royal Library. He joined archaeological and philological societies in Paris, Rome, and of course Berlin. In search of art and to perfect his German, he walked across Europe. He claimed to have walked 20 to 40 miles a day in, in Germany and made the acquaintance of numerous celebrities of the art world who showed him how art appreciation, art history, and art techniques were being taught in Germany. He returned to the newly reunited states filled with twin desires to enhance the study of American philology, particularly German philology, and second, to teach Americans to study art in their own great museums as seriously and as professionally as the new crop of German philologists and scientists were studying their subjects. After a failed opportunity at Allegheny College, where he was the first American professor of aesthetics, in 1868, he took a position as lecturer on Christian architecture at Drew Theological Seminary in Madison, New Jersey. But he took up residence in New York. Interaction with the sophisticated and well-to-do society of New York and the interest they showed in art and the classics led to the remarkable year of 1868-9. America had nothing like the network of philological associations that Comfort had witnessed in Germany. Our first learned organization was the American Philosophical Society, founded in 1743. And the only philological group was the American Oriental Society, essentially a Yale operation, not really a national group, which was founded in 1842. Comfort circulated a letter inviting all professors of language of respectable standing in our colleges, universities, theological seminaries, and other schools of high education to attend a meeting here on November 13, 1868, at which it was decided that there would be a full and formal meeting of philo uh, uh, philologists at Poughkeepsie in July 29, 1869, called, quote, a convention of American philologists. It was the first such association in the country, and Comfort laid out a list of seven areas of interest that covered the broad range of philology. The non-classical aspects of these fields would gradually be peeled away over the years as other learned societies opened up. Comfort's first uh, role was the science of language and the history of philology, an area subsequently overtaken by the Linguistic Society of America in 1924. The second was Oriental languages and literatures, already the province of the or American Oriental Society, but on a national basis. Three, classical languages and literatures. Four, modern European languages and literatures, subsequently the province of the Modern Language Association. Five, English language and literature, which also came under the MLA. Six, aboriginal American languages, taken over by the American Anthropological Association in 1902, and seven, linguistic pedagogy. Basically, the classical part basically handed over to the American Classical League in 1905. At that first meeting, it was decided that the name of the group should be the American Philological Association. Its first president was William Dwight Whitney, the great Yale Sanskritist and former president of the American Oriental Society. Comfort was secretary of the fledgling organization until 1873. I should just add that American knowledge of art history was rare in the post-Civil War period, and Comfort's experience of museums and his relationship with their leaders made him the best qualified person in America to speak on establishing a new museum. Within six months of the founding meeting of the APA in July 1869, Comfort addressed the Union League Club in New York in November of 1869 on the need for a great art museum. A committee led by the publisher George Putnam was formed and the Metropolitan Museum of Art was begun with Comfort as principal founder. But that's another story. This has been a brief and very selective collection of pioneer notables. They began the professionalization of the American professoriate. They greatly expanded their areas of expertise. They put American scholarship on an equal footing with the European. They enlarged the lay audience for classics, and they showed real devotion to education, 
from the beginnings all the way through to the terminal degree. These New York pioneers have helped make the profession and all of us what we are today. Thank you. Thank you, Ward. Um, to move things along, we will uh, keep questions till the end. Um, our next speaker is Dee Clayman. Uh, Dee is the professor of, classics at, professor of Classics at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. She's Executive Officer of the PhD Program in Classics and President currently of CBEC. She's also the Editor-in-Chief of Oxford Bi Bibliographies, Classics, and she's past president of the APA. She is the author of books and articles on classical and Hellenistic Greek poetry, notably on Timon of Phleas and Berenike II and the Golden Age of Ptolemaic Egypt. She's currently under contract with Harvard for a new edition and translation of Callimachus for the Loeb Classical Library, and she is co-editing with Joe Farrell the forthcoming Oxford History of Classical Literature. Thank you, Dee. Well, <laughs> thank you. And, um, and thank you, Ward, for that wonderful talk. One thing I heard when I first started uh, speaking at meetings of the APA was uh, never to follow Ward Briggs, because um, he's always eloquent and always learned. Um, so, so, so thanks for that context. Um, this is now the second part of the program. It's the panel where each of us has about 10 minutes to talk about something current um, in classics in New York. Um, so my topic is the New York Classics Consortium. Um, this is a cooperative agreement. It's now 47 years old between three major graduate programs in the city. The City University of New York, <clears throat> that's CUNY, NYU, and Fordham University. It was began, uh, begun rather in um, 1971, and just at the MA level when it started, because the CUNY graduate program only was an MA program at that point. Then it was expanded to the PhD level in the 1980s, and Fordham was added in 1994. Now we have a combined faculty of 35 um, professors of classics, and we teach 50 PhD students and eight MA students. The, the dramatic difference in numbers between PhDs and MAs is kind of an interesting phenomenon, uh, and I won't talk about it now, but uh, something we can think about later. Um, but the number 50 is the number is not a historical number of not adding up students of past years. It's the number we're teaching right now. So this is a very large program, and it's lasted a very long time. And so, I mean, one question one could ask is, is why? I mean, how does it, how does it work? Um, it's lasted because it does work. And it works, I think, um, not only because of the goodwill of the participants, but um, because it has a very clear structure. Um, there are some things that we share and some things that we don't. Um, what we don't share are admissions, we don't share financial aid, um, unfortunately. Um, we don't share requirements, and we don't share general exams, like oral exams. Um, these are features that are tied very closely to the structure and the rules of the individual universities. And of course, they're different. Um, what we do share is the curriculum, the courses, the teaching, the students and the faculty, therefore, and also an increasingly classroom space. Um, and, and so you might wonder how it is that we, we manage to do this. And um, the answer to that is we have a committee, naturally. It's a, a sm very small committee with a representative from each of the universities that meets once, maybe twice a year to work out um, the courses that will be offered in the following year. Um, we don't have uh, prescriptive rules. We do have a record of all the courses that we've taught over the last decades. 
And, and, and it occurs to me that this might actually be an interesting historical document. Um, so I'm going to take it out <laughs> tomorrow and look at it and see what kind of interesting information it might have about the way that classics has developed in New York over the years. But, but basically, we use it uh, to avoid overlaps because it's easy to forget that you've you know, offered a course in Hellenistic poetry just last year, and maybe you shouldn't offer it again the following year because there, there won't be enough students to take it. We try to balance the Latin and Greek and poetry and prose, um, history and thematic courses and anything at all that, that, that can be balanced. Um, we, we offer our composition course, which is required by all of the universities every single year in a fixed rotation. But that's really the only thing that's, that's fixed. Um, and the result of that is that we offer the students a menu of seven to nine graduate courses in Latin Greek and classical studies every single semester. And I, I haven't looked lately, but I, I would wouldn't be surprised, I would be surprised if there was another graduate program in classics that could match that range of offering. And what that means in turn is that um, there's no interest a student could have that can't be met by some faculty at one of the universities. Um, and we do share our, our students, and we talk with our students, and sometimes the students aren't even aware uh, of what institution a particular faculty member is, is part of. Because we also teach at each other's campuses. We try to have the courses um, every day, but in the late afternoon and evening, so that the students can teach at undergraduate courses during, during the day. Um, and, and they do. And we also try to set it up so that the two courses on any given evening are at the, are at the same campus, so the student can take both. And um, that means that sometimes we teach at each other's campuses, and that's been kind of fun and, and interesting. We also share library resources, and we share special events, like, like this one. Um, and there are also some other benefits. There, are, there is tremendous cost saving for the universities, because they can guarantee an, absol <clears throat> an absolutely first-rate classics program <clears throat> while still um, having a very small, a relatively small number of professors. Um, that they pay, and it, it also gives the individual classics departments more political clout within their institutions. Um, because who's going to cancel um, a, out a small department when two other universities depend on it to continue to exist and to teach their students? Um, they, they couldn't, and, and they wouldn't. Um, it would be an embarrassment. <clears throat> but the best result, I think, is the pleasure of serving a very large and thriving classics community in New York. And now you're going to hear about some other aspects of that. So thank you. Thank you, Dee. I'm delighted to introduce our next two speakers who will be doing a joint presentation. They are Professor Hardy Hansen and Professor Catherine Lusu. Hardy Hansen is Professor Emeritus of Classics at Brooklyn College. He is a P MA and PhD from Harvard and taught at Brooklyn College and the CUNY Graduate Center from 1971 to 2008. But for the last 41 summers, and I want to repeat that, for the last 41 summers, he's taught in the Greek Institute, for which he and Gerald Quinn, of course, wrote the introductory textbook, which we know affectionately as Hansen and Quinn. He served as director of the Latin Greek Institute from 1993 to 2013, and then he was succeeded by Catherine Lu Su, who joined Brooklyn College as an assistant professor of classics and as director of the Latin Greek Institute. She received her PhD from the University of Michigan, 
And her research interests are mainly on mythology and heroism, but also include Greek tragedy, late antiquity, and papyrology. Thank you. Um, well, the, the Latin Greek Institute, like the Classics Consortium, uh, as you may be able to tell from two of us being up here, is a collaborative venture in, in many ways. Uh, it's a Brooklyn College undergraduate program enrolling both undergraduates and graduate students from all over the country, offered every summer at the CUNY Graduate Center. At first credit where credit is due, Floyd Moreland established the institute, the Latin Institute then, in 1973 and gave it the structure it still has. Jerry Quinn and I helped Floyd, Rita Fleischer, and Stephanie Russell set up the Greek program five years later. The whole unlikely project would never have succeeded without the help of Ethel Wolf, a considerable force in promoting classics and the humanities at Brooklyn College and in New York. Uh, the Institute's basic programs in Latin and Greek are, in Floyd's phrase, beyond the intensive. We take students in 10 weeks from basic morphology and syntax to close reading of original texts, such as Cicero's First Catalinarian, Plato's Ion, Book Four of Virgil's Aeneid, selections from Euripides Medea. The course requires a full-time commitment from faculty and students. Classes meet all day, five days a week for 10 weeks. Well, how do we do this? Let me describe our approach to the languages and our teaching methodology. First, our approach, we're very old-fashioned uh, about grammar. Um, our aim is active mastery of forms and syntactical rules rather than passive recognition. In the textbooks which we wrote for the course, Moreland and Fleischer and Hansen and Quinn, we present entire systems together, for example, the passive voice, the types of conditional sentence. The subjunctive and in Greek the optative are presented in the first few days rather than being reserved for later as too difficult. In class, we ask the students to translate literally and account for the syntax of everything. We also have them ring changes, for example, by changing one type of conditional sentence to another. So they're always actively generating new forms, new sentences. The payoff for this comes when the students turn to reading real Latin or Greek in the even more intense second half of the course. They spend more than a month doing this. We insist on the same clear literal translation the same explanations of syntax, and the same active command of the language as the starting point for understanding the style and idiom of Cicero or Plato or Virgil or Euripides. Now to how we teach the course. Institute teaching is different from any other teaching. The entire course is team taught by three or four faculty in each program. Everyone shares all the teaching duties in rotation, morning classes, afternoon grammar lectures, optional site translations, grammar reviews, and so forth. In an ordinary curriculum, this would be a recipe for disaster. What would happen if we all gave different or inconsistent answers? Uh, in fact, this almost never happens, because each of the 50 instructional days is precisely planned hour by hour. And every year before the program begins, the faculty pre-teaches the material to make sure we're absolutely clear and consistent in our presentation every minute of the summer. Our pre-sessions, as we call them, are just as essential even if you've been teaching the course for many years. If you'd like to see how the Institute works, we invite you to come and visit. Our classrooms are always open. Visitors are welcome. And when one of the faculty isn't teaching, we'll stop by the classes to get a sense of how things are going. During lectures, too, the other faculty are right there in the room. This takes some getting used to, but it's a really great way to teach. If you miss something on the board, you'll you'll see that something's wrong pretty quickly. Uh, nor does uh, our faculty involvement end when classes are done for the day. We encourage students to stay around after class and work together in groups. The faculty are at the Graduate Center long after classes end, going over the material we'll be teaching in the days ahead. Students are always stopping by with questions, and we never mind being interrupted. What's more, we're available by phone at any hour. We encourage students to call, and we expect them to. We want them to complete the assignment and even go over it a second time before the next morning's classes so those classes can further reinforce the new material. We ask a lot, but we're working right along with the students day and night. This gives you an idea of the ethos of the Latin Greek Institute, how it sustains all of us every summer, why faculty return year after year, and why graduates return to teach in the Institute. One more thing, uh, every summer when the students finish the first part of the Greek program, we hold the Hoplite Challenge Cup, the verb morphology contest, uh, which pits the faculty against a team of student volunteers. It's an exciting and occasionally terrifying contest, 
And yes, the students do win their share of games. Now, you can play too. Just download the Hoplite Challenge app for iOS or Android, written by our colleague and CUNY graduate student, Jeremy March. Coming soon is a two-player version, so you can challenge your friends at any hour of the day or night. <laughs> Thank you, Hardy, for that explanation of our history, ethos, and structure of the Institute. Uh, I'd like to spend my few minutes now talking about the impact and the contribution of the Institute and the role that it plays in the larger ecosystem of the field of classics and the humanities more broadly. Who are our students and where do they go? Our students are a mix of undergraduate and graduate students, ambitious high schoolers, and retirees. Many of our undergrads want to become classics majors or apply to graduate school for history or philosophy. Our grad students may be uh, preparing for language exams or uh, preparing to conduct research in fields such as uh, English or religious studies. This combination of interests and ages creates a unique learning environment in which everyone comes from different places but is devoted to the same purpose. Uh, in recent years, even at a time when language enrollments may be dropping at other institutions around the country, we've actually seen increased enrollments, ranging on average from 70 to 85 students across three programs. When they leave us, some students may enter intermediate classes in the fall, but many go straight into advanced language classes or dive into original, uh, original sources for their dissertation research. They go on to a wide array of careers, some becoming well-known classicists who teach at the university and high school level, others pursuing careers in business or law or medicine, and even one professional Frisbee player. By nature, the program tends to attract a group of racially, socioeconomically, and culturally diverse students who do not have years to spend on elementary language study, and they must catch up to their more privileged peers who had exposure earlier on. For these students, the Institute is a critical gateway to classical learning. They not only are equipped with top-notch training, but they also are mentored closely by a team of devoted faculty and become peers with students from a range of institutions across the country. Our program then not only enables them to achieve their personal and academic goals, but also helps to diversify the humanities nationwide at every level. But this kind of work requires investment from many sources. Summer is a time when many inequalities become more obvious. Some students can take unpaid internships or travel abroad, but others must work to afford their regular tuition and living expenses or might be carrying educational debt. Paying tuition for our program, moving to New York City for the summer, and foregoing paid work is often not feasible for many students who need the training most. In recognition of our work to level the playing field for underrepresented students, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation awarded us a $1 million grant in 2016 to endow scholarships for students with financial need. We've also raised funds from the Crest Foundation and friends and alumni of the program to fund additional tuition scholarships. In the past two years, since we've had the New Yorkos Foundation funding, our enrollments have increased alongside an increased proportion of students on financial aid. Recently, 40 to 50% of our students are on some form of scholarship or another. This demonstrates to me that students' desire to learn Latin and Greek has not diminished. Rather, we need to show potential students that their study is financially feasible and that we are committed to helping them gain the intellectual rewards that they seek. At the Latin Greek Institute, we provide more than just verb morphology context, contests and syntax drills. We offer more broadly a transformative experience that trains students in high standards, accountability, excellence, and what it means to really learn something well, something that I can attest to as a former student myself. One of the great things about intensive language study is that students can really see how quickly they progress week to week. Although there is often some tough going in the first few weeks of the program, those memories tend to fade as they begin to read the very authors who inspired them to learn in the first place. Many students tell us that the Institute is the most challenging academic experience that they have had to date. And for some, that struggle for the very first time really shakes their sense of self. But when they come to the end of it and look back, they can take genuine pride in how much they have accomplished for themselves, and it changes the way they view themselves as students and scholars for the better. 
Gaining intellectual confidence is a hard-earned process sometimes, but once they own it, it is truly theirs. Not everyone may want to learn Latin and Greek at this pace, in this kind of environment, but many students do, especially the ones who most and best represent the new voices that our field and our society need. We look forward to next summer and the ones that follow and all that our students will accomplish. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Schneider. Jennifer is the chair of the Classics Department of Brooklyn Latin School. She has been a certified public school Latin teacher since 2011. And at Brooklyn Latin, she advises her school's feminist student union, dance troupe, aptly named Saltare. I'll repeat that, Saltare. <laughs> the Kataman Club, and she runs a diversity initiative that provides free test prep for Title I students throughout Brooklyn and Queens, and this helps promote racial equity in the specialized high schools. Jennifer. Thank you. I'd like to start off by saying thank you to Helen for inviting me to NYU and to the Society for Classical Studies and the Center for Ancient Studies for hosting this wonderful celebratory event, and to my headmaster, Gina Mauschke Mitchell, for her leadership and for continuing to believe in the importance of classical education in New York City public schools. My name is Jennifer Snyder, and I am the chair of the Classics Department at the Brooklyn Latin School, located in Bushwick, Brooklyn. I first joined TBLS in 2012 after having taught, la taught Latin in Harlem and completed my MAT at, in Classical Humanities at UMass Amherst. I grew up in Brooklyn. I attended public schools my entire life, and when I finally made the decision to become a teacher, I knew I wanted to give back to the city that had given me so much and pay it forward to the New York City public school system. When I first learned about TBLS from a fellow UMass alum, I had trouble believing that it was real. <laughs> it was everything that I had ever hoped a school could be. Warm, rigorous, diverse, community-oriented, all with the curricula based in classical studies. TBLS was founded in 2006 by headmaster Jason Griffiths under a grant seeking to fund a new wave of specialized high schools in New York, broadening a previously limited selection that had existed in the early 20th century of Bronx Science, Stuyvesant, and Brooklyn Tech. Our school would be the only specialized high school with a focus on classical humanities, including four years of Latin and classical studies in art, art history, literature, and ancient history. Jason also modeled TBLS on the Boston Latin School, founding our institution on the essential features of declamation, Socratic seminar, Latin nomenclature, uniforms, and most radically, a free international baccalaureate program for every single student. The IB program challenges students to take all of their classes in their junior and senior years at a college level, culminating in a series of exams during their senior year that can award them college credit. Some of our students go on to earn a semester or an entire year of college credit in their subsequent studies. Um, in addition to writing a 4,000 word research paper on a topic of their choosing and spending 150 hours in their extracurricular activities. While most students at other schools opt into this program, making it a process that limits it only to self-selected top performing students, at TBLS every student takes IB courses and works toward an IB diploma, all while never paying a dime to do so. There are 964 world IB schools in the US and 54, 56 in New York State, 13 of which are public schools in New York City. TBLS is currently the only public school in New York City that offers IB Latin. We are also one of 10 IB schools in the tri-state area to offer Latin, the only one of which that is IB for all. We have the largest contingent of IB Latin students in the entire world. We have 150 seniors approximately each year sitting for the IB exam and 300 approximate registered candidates between junior and senior years. Lastly, we are the only public school to offer both Latin and ancient Greek for the diploma. For us as IB Latin teachers, that means taking students from zero Latin on the day that they enter our school in the ninth grade to eventually translating Ovid at sight, commenting on the poetic art of Catullus, 
Horace and Virgil, after having translated almost 500 lines of Latin unadapted poetry, and then guiding them to write a self-directed research paper that analyzes seven to 12 primary sources from the ancient world. Today, after graduating eight classes, our school has grown from 50 students at our onset to almost 700 students, and we are proud to be the most racially and ethnically diverse of all state eight of the specialized high schools, um, or 60% of our students qualify as low income. 99% of our students end up being admitted to and attending four-year colleges or universities, and 55% of those students end up being the first in their families to attend college. We've been ranked among the top five high, five high schools in New York City, and among the top 25 in the country by US News and World Report since 2015. But while we've come a very long way in the 12 short years that we have been around, we still have a very long way to go. We know that we are all very keenly aware of how quickly our field is shrinking. And as we continue to grapple with ways to fight for its survival, I definitely do not pretend to have all of the answers about how to do so. But I do believe that the heart of our future lies in the way we educate and inspire our students. With that, I'd like to offer up a little acronym. Who doesn't love a good acronym, right? And a series of questions that my colleagues and I like to consider as we teach and do our work. My acronym for you is ARC, making our teaching accessible, relatable, and captivating. To start, I'd like to mention a name to you that I'm sure you've all heard countless times before, Apollo. If I asked you to conjure up an image in your mind of who Apollo was or what he might look like, you might come up with something like this. So would I. <laughs> when I say Apollo to my students, however, they might have a slightly different image in mind, maybe something that looks a little bit more like this, or they might take it somewhere completely different and think about this, right? Or maybe even this, or maybe even something like that. So <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that all of our students that we teach have access points into the classical world, and part of what we do is help draw them in through the different access points that they already possess. NASA manager Abe Silverstein said that he came up with the name Apollo for his space mission in 1960 because he thought that Apollo riding his chariot across the sun was appropriate to the grand scale of his proposed program. All of those images relate to the Apollo, maybe not the one that we recognize, but through connections of the sun, of music, of superhuman strength, they can all be used to draw our students into the classical world. When we think of accessibility, we also think about whether our curricula are designed so that any student can succeed. At TBLS, we do not use a textbook. Rather, we write all of our own materials, starting off with adapted versions of the text that students end up reading their senior year in their unadapted forms all the way down to Latin I. We teach grammatical concepts in order of how often they appear in our Latin literature, that means the supine is out, unfortunately. <laughs> and we start with the perfect tense and all three declensions simultaneously in the nominative and accusative cases. We use frequency lists for the authors we read to generate the lexicons that our students learn. When we think about teaching Latin, Greek, and classical studies, we also think about the way in which it is best for our students to be learning the material that we're teaching them. Is the way that we're teaching them the way that we learned how to become engaged and um, know more about classics? Or is what we're teaching them simply the way that we ourselves like to be taught? These are questions that we have to actively ask our students when we think about what it is that we are going to be presenting to them in the material that we have in our classes. When it comes to relatability, we ask ourselves whether our students can see themselves in what we're teaching them, in the wide variety of ethnicities, of skin tones, of cultures, of practices of the ancient world that mirror our own. Additionally, are we giving our students opportunities to make classics their own, 
either by relating to the material in non-traditional ways. Here's my student Moises, who's written a rap about the exchange between Jupiter and Venus in book one of the Aeneid, or take ownership of their identity within classics itself. Like, <laughs> we'll skip that one for now. Like Terence, who was our ancient history expert on our Kurtaman team. Students don't always need to show comprehension through a translation or through a verb synopsis. They can do that in a way that's meaningful to them. Lastly, are we making an effort to be captivating? The common refrain that we hear from students is about what it is that instills their love of a subject is first seeing that passion personified through a zealous teacher. Are we still in touch what it, with what it is that first made us fall in love with classics in the first place? And if so, how are we sharing that with our students? And as much as we are in the practice of talking through our teaching, are we taking enough time to really listen about what it is that our students enjoy learning about? What excites them? What they're curious about? What do they ask questions about the most? For it is in those questions that we might find the key to helping them to unlock a world that we have all come to know and love so deeply, a key to a world that they can carry with them into their own future. We welcome now Jason Petticone, the co-founder and president of the Paideia Institute. He's also an adjunct professor in the classics department at Fordham University and Brooklyn College. He received his PhD from Princeton, and he currently oversees Paideia's US operations and European abroad programs. His writing and public speaking focus on public humanities, Latin and Greek pedagogy, and the history of classical scholarship. In 2015, together with Paideia co-founder Eric Hewitt, Jason was awarded the President's Award by the Society for Classical Studies for outstanding achievements in promoting the study of classics. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, it's an honor to be here and be sharing the stage with so many um, outstanding classicists doing so much uh, for the study uh, and to see some uh, familiar, friendly faces in the audience. Um, when uh, Matthew Sakatoraco contacted me, uh, and asked me to talk about the Paide Institute, he said that the theme of this panel was to tell the secret history of our organization. Now, our organization is only eight years old, so there's not a tremendous amount of history, let, a, let alone secret history. Um, but I, I did think uh, it would be worthwhile maybe to uh, talk a little bit about our origins and then also talk about how the things that we're doing now maybe go beyond or uh, transcend those origins. So um, the Paide Institute was founded in 2011 to continue the legacy of Father Reginald Foster. For those of you who don't know him or know who he was or is still, he's still alive but retired now, uh, Father Foster is a Carmelite monk and priest and he was a papal Latin secretary who worked under four popes in Rome. Uh, that was his day job, and at, uh, after hours, he would teach Latin. During the school year, he taught at the Gregorian Pontifical University, and then in the summer, he ran a legendary summer Latin finishing school for anybody who wanted to show up and be schooled in uh, Latin language, literature, uh, and history amongst the ruins of Rome and the ancient world. Um, so when he retired in 2008, myself and another uh, group of former students of his uh, had the idea that uh, this experience of studying Latin with him uh, in Rome and learning to speak Latin, he, he was a, a, a spoken, spoken Latin to him was normal being from, being from the church, uh, that, that we couldn't let this tradition die. And so uh, we founded a nonprofit organization to continue that tradition. Um, and that was the beginning of the Paideia Institute. Since that time, uh, those of you who know us best will probably know that we've taken that experience that we had with Father Foster and expanded it into a suite of programs. So we now offer uh, six uh, Reginald, Reginaldian-esque experiences, uh, which are grounded in this experience of learning to speak the ancient languages and make them uh, your own amidst the ruins of the ancient world. So those include uh, Living Latin in Rome, which is our flagship college Latin program. 
uh, Living Greek in Greece, which is a conversational Attic Greek philosophy program held in a, a beautiful garden on the coasts of the Peloponnese. Uh, and then also high school programs of, uh, high school versions of those two programs. And I'm particularly uh, proud and happy about our Living Greek in Greece high school program, which is an ancient Greek summer program uh, for high school students. It requires no knowledge of ancient Greek uh, to get in. And we had 30 students sign up, uh, come to learn ancient Greek in Greece this year. So that was an exciting thing. Uh, in addition to that, we also offer two programs in France. Uh, living Latin in Paris, which focuses on uh, the Latin of the Middle Ages, obviously, since Paris is the intellectual capital of the Middle Ages, and um, Caesar in Gaul, which is a two-week program in the south of France designed to get high school teachers excited about t teaching AP Caesar, which uh, is no small feat. Um, uh, so that, that's uh, sort of the core of our activity and what's we, what we got started doing. Um, but we're trying to do a lot more than that, and so I want to focus the majority of my remarks on letting people know um, what those efforts are. So these programs, and, and more broadly, the energy uh, that came from uh, studying with Reginald has been sort of transmuted now into a number of different activities, um, which some of you may not know about. So one, one of those is our Rome Fellowship. So. Uh, as a result of our uh, classical tours service, which provides logistical support to high schools and colleges doing spring break trips and uh, summer programs abroad, we were able to create a postgraduate fellowship in Rome. So this uh, enables some of the most impressive students who come to do our programs uh, to spend a year in Rome after graduation. Um, and uh, that's an amazing opportunity for them. They learn Italian, they're trained in, in Latin and, and Greek, and it's a real benefit. It's only open to students who have previously done uh, Paideia programs, and it's a real uh, benefit opportunity. As far as I know, it is the only postgraduate fellowship for undergraduates to Rome uh, in, in the field of classics, which is kind of a, a remarkable thing. Um, we also started, uh, as our institute grew, we started thinking about ways uh, we could combat the trend that many of my fellow speakers have been remarking about, which is a decline in interest and enrollment. And one of those projects has been our ICORA outreach program. So uh, ICORA is um, a program that you, teaches Latin to um, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in underserved communities uh, with a focus on using Latin as a tool to teach English literacy. We all know that 70% uh, roughly of the English language comes from Latin, but there had never before been a really sophisticated and national effort to weaponize, if you will, Latin uh, to go after the literacy epidemic. So the i program has been thriving. Uh, we're now, uh, I think we have uh, about 40 individual centers. It's being taught in 40 elementary schools all across the country. We focus on schools in underprivileged areas. So most of our students are uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged. Um, and uh, we've developed a curriculum which is uh, bringing that program forward. And I'd like to thank the Onassis Foundation uh, in particular for <clears throat> supporting i with a really generous grant that has helped make that possible. Uh, the other program that we have uh, is called the Legion Project. This is also an outreach project, and if ICORA is going after the, uh, the, the youngest potential learners, uh, the Legion Project is trying to help uh, people on the other side of the pipeline. Uh, it probably is not lost on many people sitting in this room that the job market for PhDs in classics is not great right now. Um, and uh, this program is designed to sort of help fight the stigma uh, attached to those of us who did PhDs and might not have made it into a, a traditional tenure track academic career. So um, we tracked down, uh, using methods which I'll describe in a second, uh, everyone uh, we could find, which was a lot of people, who had done a PhD in classics in America, in North America, since 1980. It was about, uh, we searched through about 5,000 records and tracked down uh, hundreds of non-academic classics PhDs and began uh, sort of celebrating them 
on our website. So if you go to our website and visit the Legion Project, you can click on the profiles of various legionnaires, as we call them, and um, read their story. So this woman, for instance, is a, uh, a documentary filmmaker with a PhD in comparative literature focusing on the ancient world. And so we've collected a, a database of about 50 of these published legionnaires um, and uh, are, are working on tracking down many more. And it's a very exciting initiative. It's also opened up a bunch of really interesting data. So we were able to get some really robust data on non-academic outcomes. You can see uh, the various things people with classic PhDs go on to do. And uh, we were able to work together with the SCS um, to create a career networking event at the annual meeting. So this year, for the second year in a row, we're going to do sort of like a, a job, an alt-ac job fair. I don't like the term alt-ac. I prefer ultra-ac. Um, but uh, so that it's been a really fruitful event and it's been exciting to reconnect with some of these people and get them back into the discipline and work with them to help other uh, uh, classics PhDs who are looking for what to do with themselves uh, possibly beyond the tenure track. Now, uh, to the extent that I can talk about secret history, uh, I want to highlight one other program that we have because you may be wondering how on earth did we get all of this done in the past eight years? Um, particularly doing things like Googling 5,000 records of PhDs. Um, the, the way this all happened is through a, a special program, which is not highly publicized. Um, it's our summer humanities internship, or as we uh, affectionately call it, living labor in Rome. Um, <laughs> this program brings a, a group of classics undergraduates over to Rome. And basically what it does is it creates a office environment. Uh, it gives them an opportunity to work in a nonprofit setting. Uh, but they work on these problems. So a huge part of the curriculum for the ICWARE program, all of this research for the Legion Project has been, excuse me, has been done by summer interns in the Summer Humanities Internship. This program has been extraordinarily successful, uh, worryingly so, in fact, uh, because uh, students seem to be more interested in getting a line on their CV for, of nonprofit experience than they do in summer language learning. So that's a little worrying. Uh, but we have had uh, groups of people come over and do really amazing work for us. Um, so I wanted to highlight that program and encourage you to suggest it to your students. OK, I will close in a minute, but uh, I don't want to do so before mentioning one last initiative, which is forthcoming. Uh, we have been toiling for the past two and a half years on a new Latin textbook. Uh, and I wanted to give you a sneak peek of that. Uh, what we have tried to create uh, is an online multimedia platform, which can be used in classrooms, uh, but also presents a sort of standalone opportunity for anyone, anywhere, uh, in the English-speaking world at least, to sign on to the internet and teach themselves Latin. Um, we're tentatively calling it Living Latin. Uh, so it includes uh, grammar training, so we have short cartoons that teach uh, Latin grammar. Uh, it includes uh, teacher training. Uh, there is a textbook which is interestingly set in the modern world. So this is humanist Latin, uh, modern Latin, which, you, which describes the, the island of Manhattan in uh, 1700. It's not set in antiquity. And um, it also uh, includes a very interesting film, which, which I'll, I'll close by giving you a little sneak peek of. So uh, pardon the shameless uh, self-promotion because I'm in this scene, uh, but we, we were on a tight budget, so we couldn't afford uh, actors. So Virgil's poetry is all about truth and beauty. Just take a look at this verse. What does his use of elision tell us about what the poet is trying to do with this sentence? Anyone? Anyone else? Okay, yes, Mark A. Hakmodo were gilio scribit, ut mihi videtor, quia claritatem et motum gurgitus imitari velit. Et poeta ita totam skynam rapidiorem et vividiorem redit. How many times do I have to tell you guys? Latin is a dead language. Ita est dudicus, lingua latina mortua est. Sed hac de causa est facta immortalis. Emo. Methodus illa mi amicae, et ratio docendi quam profitator ille magis delus. So to aware I'm more to I. <laughs> I. I can't even understand you guys. And I'm the one with a PhD. Now, who can tell me why ictus est fictus? Laetitia. 
So anyway, that's a sneak preview into the first scene in this film. And also the textbook tells a story of this group of kids who live in Brooklyn and love speaking Latin and then eventually go off to study in Rome. So uh, that'll be coming out in December and we're very excited about it. It's our latest contribution. So thank you very much. Helena P. Foley is Clateau Professor of Classics at Barnard College, Columbia University. She's the author of many books and articles on Greek epic and drama, on women and gender and antiquity, and on modern performance and the adaptation of Greek drama. These include, and I won't list them all, um, she's the author of Ritual Irony, Poetry and Sacrifice in Euripides, the Homeric Hymn to Demeter, Female Acts in Greek Tragedy, Reimagining Greek Tragedy on the American Stage. She also edited Reflections of Women in Antiquity and co-edited Visualizing the Tragic, Drama, Myth, and Ritual in Greek Art and Literature. Thank you. Okay, so today I'm supposed to be talking about performance. Um, and I planned to focus on, in this very brief presentation on actual stage performance, especially college performance in New York City or in the state as a whole, I could. Although um, <clears throat> I could actually focus on growing, in fact, can you not hear me? Okay, sorry. I could actually uh, focus on the, the proliferating scholarship on ancient music, dance, and translation, as well as on modern performance. <clears throat> performance and adaptation of um, Greek and Roman drama have, of course, appeared on the New York stage since the early 20th century and on college campuses at an even earlier date. Carolissa Hardigan in Greek Tragedy and on the American Stage and my own book, Reimagining Greek Tragedy on the American Stage, are imp an important source for professional performances in New York City. <clears throat> We could, however, go back in the tradition to an interesting book by Domus Pluguet, History of Greek Plays in American Colleges and Universities from 1881 to 1936. This man uh, did a, a master's at a teacher's college in 1938, and he actually cataloged, cataloged every single performance that he confined, confined, confined in the entire country. Um, Along with that, uh, Classical Weekly, which we heard about earlier today, um, and also even TAPA had very early, early articles on performances, um, actual performances on the American stage, which we're not really doing now. Um, and of course, all of you could go to the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts and see huge numbers of archives, which I have actually gone through myself, and they're really remarkable amounts of information about um, university and college performances going back to the 19th century. Uh, it's a topic that I didn't have space for in my own work, but there's really an enormous amount of fascinating resources. And one of the things that's most interesting about it is that performances of, of uh, Greek and Latin plays really proliferated when the requirements for many colleges no longer included Greek and Latin <laughs> uh, for entrance. And so a lot of these schools decided that a good way to rev up interest on the part of students um, was to actually perform these plays, either in English or in the original languages. And it actually seems to have worked rather well. And then it sort of proliferated into drama departments who took it over more, I think, for a while. Um, <clears throat> I also did want to mention, however, um, that there is still a lot of, besides uh, the two books I mentioned, there's really a lot of attention to um, actual performance in the city. And just to mention a few people who are our fellows in New York, um, Peter Meinek at <clears throat> NYU has done an enormous amount of scholarship on modern performance, but he's also done modern performances, and he and Brian Darius, who actually did have a classics degree as an undergraduate, have been doing an enormous amount of interesting performance with um, vets, um, plays relating to vets, and plays including vets in performances. Um, <clears throat> Linda, uh, Melinda Powers, who's at John Jay College and was a classics undergraduate and is a theater scholar, has actually been doing um, 
a lot of scholarship on um, people of color involved in performances of uh, Greek tragedy specifically or adaptations of Greek tragedy and her recent book came out on that. <clears throat> However, today, um, I'd like to really fo focus on New York performances in Greek and Latin, and in particular, being very self-serving, <laughs> on the tradition of performances by the Barnard Greek and the Latin classical drama group, because I think it is a possible model for future performances in other places, we hope. So we've been performing plays in the original languages almost annually since 1977, when they were supported by my then Barnard colleague Helen Bacon. The longer tradition in the country, the longest tradition in the country took place in Randolph Macon Women's College in Virginia um, up through the 1950s. Um, and it's now been revived in performances of English in their outdoor um, stadium. But ours have are, sorry, but ours have actually now gone on for over 40 years. Um, although the performances are supervised by faculty, they're always directed by undergraduates and graduate students, and I think that's one of the most important things about this production. I can assure you that the ideas for these performances are at least 100% better when they come from students than they actually would come from people like me who are among the supervising faculty. The directors and co-directors choose the play, and they develop their own interpretation of it in collaboration with others, and they rehearse independently of the faculty who then comes in and kind of looks at how things are going. The plays are financed by the Matthew Kramer Fund, which was established in honor of a Columbia student who was one of the early participants but died at the end of his senior year. Having this funding makes an enormous difference uh, because mustering funding is incredibly time consuming and this way we are allowed to give all of our attention to actually doing the performance. For some years, each play was accompanied by a directed reading course in which participation participants could study the play in the original. But recently, we've done something really important, which is we established a formal course to study the play with a production that follows in the spring. We've also be begun um, posting recordings of the production on Bonnard YouTube with English subtitles added. And this, we actually have many, many more recordings, but it's only recently they've been able to add the titles, which make it much more available to people. And if you haven't had a chance to take a look at any of these, um, Seneca's Thyestes, Euripides Alcestis, Aeschylus Libation Bearers, and Euripides Ion have been put up so far with many in the works that actually don't have the titles finished yet. Since the tradition is now for over 40 years old, we've decided to establish an archive at Barnard that will include memorabilia and photos, recordings, and detailed interviews with directors, musicians, choreographers, and some of the most experienced actors who've been in a number of different performances. Our goal is to provide inspiration for students and faculty at other institutions who would be interested in profiting from our experience. A group of former directors, all now with jobs and PhDs, will help me co-edit a book out of all this archival material on the tradition, but we hope to have all of it available online for people to tap in from other schools if they want to get inspiration about doing performances of specific plays. So I'd now like to summarize briefly a few things that I think have kept the tradition going and allowed it to grow over time in certain respects. Above all, this is a student-generated effort, and participants frequently call on previous students for advice. Many have participated over a period of years and were made in contact thereafter. We even have a Facebook page, and I can assure you that many people are still checking in on it on a regular basis. It's really one of the most unifying um, kinds of activities that we've ever had on our campus. Students who have directed have gone on as faculty to produce plays on other campuses. 
They have also been collaborating on doing Greek plays with the Paideia program, which you just heard about. Um, there have been several Greek plays uh, in the Greek program recently, and one of our students was Claire Cadenaccio was the sort of leading figure behind it. Um, <clears throat> my point here overall, though, is that we don't have to, in this tradition, we don't have to invent a process annually, and therefore we can maintain a kind of con continuous oral culture in which one group of students can learn from the last group of students almost any aspect of what they are going to be confronting in doing a performance. Second of all, um, New York City colleges and universities tend to attract students who are really interested in the arts. We've had a lot of resources to call on outside our own campuses from other schools, including, for example, Juilliard for musicians and composers and actors, both professors and other students from NYU. Fordham is a good example. Matthew Gowan is going to be, Matt Gowan is going to be speaking here in a minute, and he has been in our productions. Um, and graduate programs like the CUNY graduate program. Charles Barker, who is now the principal conductor for ABT and a Greek enthusiast, composed music for the Bacchae and Hippolytus in 1994 and 1995. And Nico Muli, whose opera Marnie just appeared at the Met, um, composed a continuous musical score for Iphigenia and Alice in 2005. This year, the music for Euripides Heracles is being composed by our graduate students Anna Concer and Caleb Simone, both of whom are writing dissertations involving ancient music. This is going to be the first modern performance in the world to incorporate a fully reconstructed musical score performed live on the historical instrument that originally accompanied tragedies, the double pipe or allos. We have raised funds, and we want to thank the Onassis and Delmo Foundations for our help. Um, to have a professional allos player come from Britain, his name is Colin Armstrong, an award-winning early music um, specialist from London's Tr Trinity Laban Conservatory to play the allos for the performance, as well as for a professional choreographer, sound artist, and lightning, lighting designer. Over time, we've also drawn on dancers from the Barnard's Dance Program, to say nothing of talented musicians, dancers, costume designers, set designers, and poster designers who are actual regular classic students. Since it's challenging to learn to play and memorize the roles in Greek and Latin, we've sometimes divided the main parts among several actors and even taken advantage of this to interpret the play. For example, our two Medeas in 2009 played a heroic and maternal Medea bound at the wrist. The heroic Medea eliminated the maternal Medea after she decided to kill her children. Three Hecubas in Euripides Hecuba in 2000 and three Deianeras in the 2016 Women of Trachis represented faces in the heroine's reaction to her changing situation. Some students have written senior essays related to the plays that they directed, and some former directors are now writing about their interpretations of the play for our archival project. We hope to be able to share all of this activity for you in a few years, uh, but meanwhile, we do encourage you to come and see the remarkable Heracles, we hope, in April. Thank you. Thank you. Uta Vandenberg Kagan is executive director of the American Numismatic Society. Um, she has filled that role since 1999, and prior to that, she was curate, curator of Greek coins at the British Museum in London. She is a papyrologist and a numismatist, and in addition to over 50 books and articles on papyrology and numismatics, she has organized many exhibitions at the British Museum and at the ANS, including Drachmas, Doubloons, and Dollars, The History of Money, which opened in 2002 and attracted around 30,000 visitors. Thank you very much. And I want to thank Helen for the invitation here um, to speak. And I was given collecting institutions. Um, when I began to look at this, 
I thought it's either um, a whole monograph I'm writing here, but as it was given strictly 10 minutes, I thought I'd look a little bit at the uh, early history here um, of what is in New York. So when we look today at these large and uh, small institutions in New York, um, such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art or New York Historical Society, the Brooklyn Museum, the Grolier Club, or even my own uh, organization, the American Numismatic Society, we see these impressive buildings, big collections um, that date back to the 19th century. And uh, several half the famous collections of Greek and Roman collections, as well as other objects from the ancient world, which are part of the canon of classical education. They're nowadays among the major research institutions as well, and so the connection to the society here. What is less clear from looking at these institutions is that their path to this grandeur and success of today was not necessarily straightforward. And here really the theme, how does one get to 150 years? It seems easy looking at it, but um, it is clear that it isn't anything. Just as modern startups, there are as many stories of failures in comparison to the better known uh, stories of the winners. And some institutions struggled at the beginning uh, to get established. And here for museums, or what was known under this name in the 19th century, um, there were these various predecessors, which were often commercial operations, uh, often a rather curious mix of circus an art gallery, um, you know, showing the first Egyptian mummies uh, alongside a, a sheep with five legs and other things, an orchestra playing um, in places such as the um, museum here by John Scudder or the various um, institutions that the Peel family, famous American painters, had set up with um, what you see here um, in Philadelphia, but there was also one by his um, son here in New York. Um, this extraordinary collection of the sometimes the natural and historical specimens, oddities, and art were displayed there. And for example, when Peel's Museum here in New York um, was closed um, and sold eventually in 1849 because of lack of funds, most of the collections were dispersed, and P.T. Barnum, better known, of course, for the circus, bought many of these great artworks and other things, which unfortunately all got destroyed in a disastrous fire in um, 1865, very famous uh, event. You know, sort of somehow reminiscent, I was thinking of the big fire in Rio, you know, how much we have in lost as culture. By the 1850s, so we're coming closer to the period when these organizations of ours were founded then, increasing numbers of societies and associations were founded in which interested men met to discuss a huge variety of subject. It was in this period that many of the organizations like the American Philological Association, now the Society for Classical Studies, were founded. Many of them were initially community oriented at first and provided a space in the rapidly growing city of New York City alongside other institutions of cultural spaces um, for music, theater, parks, um, as well as the scientific and learned institutions. Civic engagement became an important focus of the wealthy and educated citizens with the idea that life in cities should improve for the betterment of all citizens. And undoubtedly here, the largest one is the um, um, establishment of Central Park in 1857, designed by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vaux. So um, see here the, one of the early maps. Societies then focused on collecting. Um, those were invariably founded by collectors. Um, seems obvious. Many of them um, involved in very many different organizations. You see an enormous amount of overlap of people here. And here a simple letter, for example, of invitation um, sounded a little bit like the society um, um, that um, Helen described at the beginning, just sent out by a man called Augustus B. Sage, lived on Essex Street and invited everyone to come um, to find, to basically found this society in 1858. And in the first few decades, the society and its growing collections kept moving around, 
was incorporated in 1865. An interesting notice, the name, this was the original name, was the American Numismatic and Archaeological Society, a name that was only abandoned after the Metropolitan Museum was finally founded. Um, the Grolier Club is a similar kind of institution which was founded by Robert Ho, a printing press manufacturer and book collector. The, no, the nature of these early meetings um, had a strong social component, but right from the beginning, there was a very strong scholarly ambition for all these, and this is really true for many of these organizations. And time is a little limited here, obviously, so I'm looking at uh, my own organization to look how um, an organization would develop here. Society members, in the case of the American uh, Numismatic Society with a very extensive archive that goes right back to the foundation, show that pure conversations and keeping coins antiquities was not sufficient. The American Journal of Numismatics, um, a, today a peer-reviewed journal, was founded in 1866 in order to record the proceedings. And again, here a clear parallel um, to the um, APO Society of Classical Studies. Over the next decades or so, um, as other institutions in established um, in their own buildings, um, the American Numismatic Society used to just move around uh, through various rented quarters um, and were eventually on 20th Street, uh, a location, if one reads in the archives, various letters, was far from ideal. Um, Howard Adelson described this in our history here, how the society tried to persuade the landlady, a Mrs. Eliza Graham, to remove large advertising signs for the doctors with which they are, um, were sharing headquarters. And Mrs. Graham then said, yes, um, I'll have them removed, but maybe the doctors could use the water you have um, in your premises. And so this was all not ideal. Um, interesting, at that very point in time, um, the society had some of the wealthiest members um, of, of the wealthy real estate in New York here. Andrew Sabrisky, who'd become the president of the society, began to advocate the purchase of a building or maybe sharing a space with the Metropolitan Museum of Art, or indeed what was planned, a merger with the New York Historical Society, which went so far and was so unpopular with the members that uh, he resigned in 1904. Here the turning point comes, and this is always the interesting thing, how does an organization that's just a bunch of collectors and amateur become an academic institution? And here the turning point is really um, the election of Archer Huntington as president in 1905. He was the stepson of the uh, railroad magnate Collis P. Huntington and the founder of the Hispanic Society, Brooklyn Gardens, a sculpture center in uh, South Carolina a benefactor of very great many institutions and universities. As the head of the American Numismatic Society, he was responsible for the society's move uptown, where the former estate of John James Alderman was turned into a museum island for the Hispanic Society of America, the American Ar Academy of Arts and Letters, the American Geographical Society, and the Hay Foundation. Finally, the society had a proper home together with all these other museums and learned society. This move was not exactly uncontroversial, in particular since Huntington's influence on the society and the other institutions mentioned went beyond real estate and donations. Under his presidency, the society moved towards a more, much more academic model and um, the first curator was appointed, actually a woman, um, rather remarkable, Agnes Waldbeam Brett, a graduate of Barnard College, a member of the American School of Classical Studies in Athens. Um, at the same time, Edward Newell had joined the society, graduate of Yale. Um, in 1916, he became the president of the society at the age of 30. And under his leadership, the society turned into the serious academic institution um, that it is fundamentally today. Um, supported by Huntington and many other wealthy uh, donors, an enormous um, growth um, started with the society it has today over 800,000 objects and foremost academic numismatic library in America. So Archer Huntington was the most significant donor until his death in 1955, 
And his interest in academic numismatics allowed the, the creation of um, programs of all sorts. Um, so, you know, really keeping this very academic tradition uh, going. Through his interactions with the society, the money he gave, and it was really surely enormous sums, um, Huntington transformed the ANS, which became a serious place for the study um, of numismatics as well as classics and other fields, and um, became then in 1937, was elected to the American Council of Learned Societies. So um, in the last century, so you know, this focus of the society has then largely been on Greek and Roman numismatics. In that sense, actually also very interesting that the development was a little bit like it was a very broad setup. And although um, I think the American Numismatic Society continues to cover all fields, um, there are many people um, from other fields saying it is too Greco-centric, Roman-centric, this whole. But um, today, the, out the outreach program in is includes all sorts of things. Here we see um, the summer seminar, which is a graduate program to teach numismatics, but also we have school children lectures and other things. Um, it shows how a society as one of the collecting institutions uh, can grow, and I'm particularly pleased here to be able to congratulate the Society for Classical Studies, and I'm confident that it will go well to promote the next 150 years. Thank you. Oh, good. Matt is here. <laughs> Matthew McGowan, a classicist from Fordham University, publishes on a range of authors and topics from Virgil on Ovid to Renaissance Latin and teaching the classics. His book, Ovid in Exile, Power and Poetic Redress, in the Tristia and Espitula ex Ponto, appeared in 2009 from Brill. He's now working on a book-length survey of Latin lexicography in ancient Rome. He teaches a wide range of courses from classical myth to advanced Greek, to Roman elegy and Latin prose composition. And he currently serves as the SCS Vice President for Communications and Outreach and President of the New York Classical Club. Oh, yes. Well, past President of the oh, New York Cla sorry, Classical Club, which is uh, my topic for today. I just want to say, although I came late and I missed the introduction, I was teaching, so I was working. Um, <laughs> And so I want to apologize for that, but I'm struck by the incredible diversity and vitality of the pursuit of classical studies in New York City, and I'm reminded of how lucky we are. I was just in Oxford for a week, well, not a week, I wish it had been a week, it was like three days, um, working on Ovid and Latin poetry, and I was thinking, wow, these people are so lucky. They are able to conduct this conversation at such a high level for so many days. And it was three days eating, drinking, sleeping, Ovid, lots of fun. But I'm reminded by this evening that they have nothing in terms of this diversity that we have here. And uh, I'm very grateful to Helen for the invitation to speak and to Matthew Santoraco, whom I don't see here, but uh, to him too and to the uh, Center for Ancient Studies and the Society for Classical Studies um, for supporting this evening. I uh, am here not uh, alone, but also representing my colleague and um, successor as president of the New York Classical Club, who is also working, in fact, working in New Jersey this evening, and that's Dr. Ron Janoff, who couldn't be here with us tonight, but he did send me his PowerPoint presentation. And he also sent me some text that I'm going to share with you uh, in presenting on regional um, associations in the uh, New York area. And so Ron, as co-president of the New York Classical Club, together with um, Alan Shapiro, has put together a wonderful presentation that you see here. So in the first slide we have, uh, in 19, I'm sorry, in 1898, the twin cities of New York and Brooklyn were joined through an act of consolidation into greater New York, the emergent world capital of the 20th century. In the heady optimism of that era, at the 
newly founded Eastern District High School in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, the new principal, Dr. William Vlyman, joined with four other high school principals to establish the New York Latin Club in June 1900. The actual architect of the club was a young member of Vlyman's Latin faculty, David H. Holmes, a PhD from the Johns Hopkins University, an expert on prepositions in Thucydides, whom Vlyman had recre recruited from the University of Kansas. Holmes wrote a formal constitution for the club, detailing its mission, structure, membership requirements, and dues. He went on to create week a weekly four-page publication, the New York Latin Leaflet, adapted from a newsletter he had created with students at Kansas. The club's first president was a Dartmouth graduate, Harry F. Towell, beloved Latin teacher at Boys High School in Brooklyn. Other notable club presidents in the first decade included Professor, Professors Harry Thurston Peck and Nelson McRae of Columbia, Gonzalez Lodge of Teachers College, Anna McVeigh of Wadley High School for Girls in Harlem, and the redoubtable Dr. William Vlyman himself. The club and the leaflet together constituted a complex of seasonal meetings and weekly publication that knitted together the highly educated classics faculties of the great public high schools, Erasmus, Boys High School, Eastern District, DeWitt, DeWitt Clinton, and Wadley, with the faculties of the newly reconstituted local universities, especially Columbia on Morningside Heights, NYU at University Heights, and the University of the City of New York at 137th Street. Most of the greater New York classics leadership in both spheres were protégés of Basil Gildersleeve at Hopkins or Charles Bennett at Cornell. Virtually all had done additional years of study in Germany, especially in Berlin or Bonn. Most of them published high school and college Latin, sometimes Greek textbooks, and readers at a time when four years of high school Latin was the gateway to college, where classics and mathematics still dominated undergraduate study. It was the era of the city beautiful and Roman revival in architecture, low li the low library um, and the Gould Memorial Library, well, the low at, at Columbia, the Gould Memorial Library at NYU, the New York Public Library, the Grant's Tomb, the Customs House, Penn Station, and the first Greco-Roman collections at the Met. The Catskill water system, the new East River bridges, the subway tunnels, the Carnegie libraries, the lavish sunlit new elementary East River uh, uh, and high schools were all underway at the same time, while as many as 10,000 immigrants a week arrived in the harbor and their children poured into the classrooms. I take it, Helen, did you mention that we have a book about all this stuff in the back there? I did not, Matt, so please mention it now. Oh, yeah. I, I can't believe it hasn't been mentioned, but if you look back on that stand, you'll see a book with the title Classical New York, which talks a lot about these things. I'm reading this, not for the first time, although it may sound like it. Um, I'm reading this, and uh, I'm struck by how many things we handle in the book, and some of, our, some of our contributors are here right now. For example, we have a wonderful article on the collection at the Met by Elizabeth Bartman which you can have a look at. And we're selling for $25 cash, which is a great discount. Um, the club brought the scholars together for its three seasonal luncheon conferences in Greenwich Village. The Latin leaflet, published in Brooklyn, was positioned as the vehicle for an ambitious scholarship program to provide financial aid to high school students who demonstrated excellence in Latin through the newly devised College Board entrance examinations. A prominent team of scholarship trustees, Grace the Masthead, Arthur Summers of the Board of Education, Nicholas Murray Butler of the College Examination Board, and soon president of Columbia University, John Houston Finley, who was the president of the City University, and Williamsburg sugar refiner, Frederick Mollenhauer. And you can make them all out over here. The enterprising Holmes devised an advertising income stream from the American Book Company and the universities to local hotels, haberdashers, and delicatessens, which paid for the printing and mailing by, prominent, by, by a prominent German printing house in Brooklyn. So that the 25 cent subscription and uh, higher patron contributions of $5 and more all went to the scholarship fund. Each issue consisted of two pages of editorial, usually a single article, and two pages of advertising. And Ron, as some of you may know, has been publishing these on a weekly basis for the last six 
years, and is um, and I think is in his last year because the um, the Latin leaf, leaflet lasted seven years. Gonzales Lodge of Teachers College was the first speaker at the Latin Club luncheon in November 1900, followed by Professor Ernst Siller of NYU at the first meeting, winter meeting. The first signed article in the leaflet on teaching the Latin hexameter was by the poet and Latin teacher Alice Van Vliet of Brooklyn's Packer Institute for Girls. Over seven years, the most frequent contributors to the leaflet were the often sententious Ernst Siller of NYU and the prolific Ernst Reese of DeWitt Clinton High School. Reese, who went on to found the classics department at Hunter College, became editor in 1903. Holmes continued to manage the business side. The club's endowment began with a large gift of $500, equivalent to $15,000 today, from Sugar Czar Frederick Molinauer in 1901, and another $500 from the sale of the Latin leaflet after 175 issues in May of 1907 to the Classical Association of the Middle States. And I draw your attention, in fact, to this farewell word um, given to us by Dr. Holmes. Um, saying that the the sale of the leaflet for five thousand dollars, I'm sorry, five hundred dollars, right, has brought the scholarship fund up to five thousand, and that will be the starting point of our discussion of the um, Classical Association of the Atlantic States. And so, from 1900 until now, true to its mission, the New York Latin Club has sponsored three annual meetings of the very local high school and college members of the club. This year's winter conference on January 25th marks the 353rd meeting of the club. The endowment now governed as a 401c3 nonprofit sponsors summer study in Rome and Athens for graduate students and high school teachers. Annual contests give cash awards to high school and college students for recitation and translation in Greek and Latin. Frequently the budding classes' first real prize. I can attest to that. I am a recipient of the Caesar Prize, when I was a sophomore in high school, it really did make a huge impact on my life. And uh, if I support anything in the, in the New York Classical Club, indeed, I have dedicated my portion of the book to it because it's so important to me personally, it's that. The President's Fund helps support annual theater in Greek and Latin, as well as an annual high school, Dionysia, which we run every year at Fordham. The current co-presidents, True to form are a high school teacher from Brooklyn and an emeritus professor from the John professor from the Johns Hopkins University as when the club was founded. And I'm just going to say two words about Cass because Matthew got a letter from Judy Hallett, who's not here, uh, but she said, you better talk about Cass. And so Matthew got on the way, he said, you better talk about Cass. And so I'm talking about Cass, which bought the Classical Weekly in 1907 from the Latin Club uh, as then the Classical Association of the Middle States in Maryland, right? And they kept David Holmes on as the manager, which was very clever until, 19, in, until um, 1908 when he retired. They had their first meeting at Columbia University in April 1907 which was fitting given that Gonzales Lodge of Teachers College and Charles Knapp of Barnard were editor-in-chief and associate editor respectively. The Classical Weekly, according to Knapp's first editorial, was for the association the means, and I quote, of communication, and you can, it's there, but you can't read it probably, between the offers of the officers of the association and the members and as the depository of the papers read at the meetings and, it is hoped, of the results of original research conducted by its members and others quite apart from the annual meetings. Kind of what the what classical world continues to do for the Classical Association of the Atlantic States today, which took its name in the following year, um, 1908, it changed its name. Um, I was struck in reading this wonderful history of the association from 1981 by um, uh, Walter Donlin about um, the various presidents and folks who, who ran the, the association, I noted that um, in the club's 111 year history, there have been 35 female presidents, which is um, I think quite a good number. Um, it was in the um, 
that era in the early 20th century when regional associations generally were being founded, with CAMWAS founded in uh, 1905 at the University of Chicago, with uh, the founding of the Classical Association of New England, or Kane, in the same year. Um, and Knapp, in fact, laments that CAMWAS had um, snapped up the South Atlantic states Right, becoming the behemoth that it is today with no fewer than 32 states and three Canadian provinces in it. And I, I lament that too, thinking that we could have an annual meeting in um, Charleston or Miami even. And so maybe, maybe we can get uh, on that bid to, to uh, reclaim those southern states. Um, <laughs> You can see the mission statements are quite similar, and all this will come out hopefully in the uh, in the art. We're going to we're going to publish this, I, I hope, um, because it's also interesting hearing what everybody has to say. Um, and I'm just going to going to close by um, noting remarkably that um, the Classical Association of the Atlantic States is in great health, although the membership has diminished appreciably from the early 80s when there were close to 700 members to perhaps 425, 450 today. But um, the uh, association over the years, in particular from the 50s through the late 70s, suffered some dire um, financial difficulties, which is certainly not the case today. This is a very well-heeled organization with assets, assets um, somewhere in the area of $2.3 million, which allows them to do such wonderful things as um, revivifying and increasing the amount of the Han scholarship. Uh, which sends um, students and others to Rome and Athens every year, um, and bringing in scholars from the outside for uh, annual meetings on the Jerry Clack Lectureship Fund, from grants for high school students. This is truly an extraordinary thing and great testimony to the vitality of the association's original mission to the well-known Leadership Initiative Grants, formerly the President Initiative Grants, supporting all kinds of innovative initiatives to promote classics in the Atlantic states and beyond, and continuing thereby to remain true to its mission. Thank you. Thank you. So that we have some hope of um, sticking somewhat close to time, I'm going to try to reduce Roger Bagnall's biography to bullet points, which is not easy, but I think most people in this room know him. Um, Roger Bagnall taught at Columbia University for 33 years and moved to NYU in 2007. He is, of course, the founding director of ISO and retired from that position in 2016. <laughs> he is a papyrologist, a social and economic historian of Hellenistic, Roman, and late antique Egypt, he is also an excavation director of the Amhida Project, jointly sponsored by Columbia, located in the Dakla Oasis in Egypt. His latest book, An Oasis City, presents the results of those excavations. He's a member of the American Philosophical Society, the Ac Ac Academy Royale de Belgique, as well as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the British Academy. He was in 2016 SCS president, and in the 1980s, he served as executive secretary of the APA. Thank you. In a uh, recent review in the Times Literary Supplement, <clears throat> Josephine Quinn reflects on several recent books <clears throat> that she reviews together because they all try to widen the view from the classical world with studies of various societies from Egypt to China, some of them explicitly comparative. After discussing the modern concept of classics and its history, Quinn alludes to a number of attempts to broaden classics into the ancient Mediterranean world and its neighbors. She concludes by asking, but are Med ancient Mediterranean societies or even their immediate neighbors the only classics of world or even Western history and culture? And is what we really want a new and expanded canon that incorporates the study of other peoples and places into the imperial history traditions and comforting hierarchies of classics. Perhaps it is time to move to a less judgmental label for a field that could incorporate Greco-Roman studies alongside rather than above other people's lands, stories, and languages. <clears throat> End of the quote. Uh, it is I believe sometimes supposed that some such concerns lay behind the founding of the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World at NYU. But this is not quite right. 
the supposedly hegemonic claims of classics were in fact not central in the thinking by Shelby White, Leon Levy, and their advisors that went into the founding of vision for ISAW. Rather, it was the baneful effects of departmentalization uh, in museums, just as much as in universities, that led to the view that an academic unit that cut across the usual spatial boundaries and brought together people who might have been in a half dozen different departments uh, could foster investigation and education with a broader outlook. <clears throat> Classics as such was not central to the problems that I saw was invented to struggle with, if not solve. When I spoke to the APA meeting of 2009 about ISAW's early development, I stressed that we did not have a predetermined intellectual agenda or even a definition of interdisciplinary study. This had to emerge from the community. With about a decade of full-scale activity behind us now, it's reasonable to ask, how is this ambition playing out? Classics is, in fact, not in any way a dominant part of the faculty, which is roughly evenly divided among those working in the classical world, those focused on the larger Near East, and those whose fields are Central and East Asia. So one might say that, in a sense, Quinn's ambition has been realized by the creation of something to which classics was not particularly central, even if the first two directors were trained as classicists. I saw is not an extension of classics, but a Eurasian entity in which the classical world plays a part. But of course, things are not really so simple. We have a doctoral program, and our students generally want to find university or museum jobs. The larger world of learning is not abandoning departments with any speed, even if there are signs of change. So we've been conscious from the outset of the need for our graduates to offer the world both the breadth of ISAW's ambitions and the bread and butter disciplinary strength necessary to meet departmental needs. So far, I think they've done as well as other doctoral programs in finding good entry-level employment on three continents, a fair match to the international character of the student body. But the challenge of maintaining a balancing act like this is not going to evaporate soon. That's at the pragmatic level. There are also intellectual reasons to push back against an approach that discards the disciplines in favor of throwing everything together. The different fields centered on particular languages or groups of languages have distinctive traditions that reflect the specific natures of their source materials, histories, transgenerational conversations, and many other aspects. These have substantive value and are not to be discarded. The integrated and disciplinary approaches should not be seen, I think, as competitors in a zero-sum game. Rather, they complement one another. And how that relationship is to be realized structurally will not be identical from one institution to another. <clears throat> and that's fine. We do not need to be prescriptive or absolutist. But where I would take Quinn's point is to insist that if an institution is not going to go the route of an ISAW, which does, remember, continue to coexist and interact with the relevant discipline-based departments at NYU, it needs to think seriously about how to achieve the objective of integrating classics into a broader ancient world as one of several partners rather than a hegemon. This is not a simple matter, and I can point to few examples that I regard as successes. And in fact, the point is equally true even if there is an ISAW, precisely because ISAW coexists with, rather than subsuming departments, all of them fiercely defensive of their autonomy uh, and disciplines, it cannot necessarily even get them to collaborate with one another. So a unit that breaks the boundaries, like I saw, cannot in itself guarantee that Quinn's goals will be achieved inside a single university. Administrators and external review committees are fond of urging greater integration, of course, um, as I saw's most recent review did. But they regularly duck the questions of power and budget that underlie the fact that no one unit has the ability to bring about such integration on its own. 
From another angle, this is a good thing. Universities and museums are famous or infamous for being conservative, slow-moving beasts. There are a lot of good reasons that they are this way. Top-down reorganizations and redirections do not have a great track record. Intelligent people with academic training do not take well to having their intellectual priorities set by somebody else. And they shouldn't. It is widely recognized by those who understand how scholars work and who have not also drunk the poison of power for too prolonged a period that the only change that succeeds is that in which most of the people involved have accepted the rationale for change and come to support it. For this reason, reorganizing the study of the ancient world by administrative fiat is unlikely to accomplish any good end. So should we want classics to become part of a broader Eurasian antiquity? And if so, where, what is the route to that goal? To the first question, I would, like Quinn, give a strongly positive response. But I would qualify it to say that any viable route to that integration of classics into the wider Eurasian scene cannot require the discarding of the discipline as such, with all of the heritage accumulated over the past half millennium. Some of that, of course, above all the philological method, is shared with other disciplines. But there is much more there, and we will rightly want to conserve it. Tamil philology and classical philology are not the same creature, as anyone reading David Shulman's eloquent book on Tamil will appreciate. Some culture-specific baggage may need to be discarded, and that would be no great loss, but we should be selective about that. The route is not so clear. Replicating ISAW cannot be the answer. It is too expensive, for one thing, and I do not think that its conception apart from the departments is optimal. I believe that fully shared faculty between such an institute and the disciplinary departments uh, are more likely to help the integration of the disciplines become a daily reality in their home departments, and not only in a separate space. This strikes me as a more likely route to reshaping disciplines like classics. It involves a delicate balancing act, however, and it is hard to get it right. Most universities that I know of leave almost all the power in the departments and give integrative initiatives too little leverage to bring about change. One question specifically put to me when I was invited to give this talk is whether the integration of disciplines in this fashion can help reshape the demography of classics and of ancient studies more broadly to make us less white in shorthand. To put it another way, can making the field look less distinctively European make it seem less reserved for those of a European background? Our experience at ISAW so far does not offer a straightforward answer to this question. Of our first six completed doctorates, three were of broadly speaking European background, two indeed EU citizens, uh, one Iranian, one Chinese, and one an immigrant from a Spanish-speaking country. The current student population doesn't look dramatically different from that, to the best of my knowledge. That's all pretty good uh, from the point of view of diversity, but it's less impressive if one is seeking to remedy this country's past disadvantaging of parts of the population. As we all know, university affirmative action programs are essentially aimed at the second of these goals, but have their tenuous legal basis in a Supreme Court decision, Baki, that legitimized only the first objective, thanks to the tactical route that Justice Powell took in order to form a majority. As the current litigation about Harvard's admissions process, practices shows, we are far from having any social convergence on how to define objectives in this area, and particularly how to understand the position or positions of Asians and Asian Americans in the taxonomy. Since our faculty in China and Central Asia attract a lot of Asian students, as do most American doctoral programs in East Asia, this is not a small matter. In general, I suspect that integrating the classics as we know them into the Eurasian landscape will be less important for the shape of the student population than for many other aspects of our work. 
And similarly, that the factors driving the shape of the student population will mostly be things other than our intellectual horizons. And I think, in fact, that some of the programs we've heard about this evening are doing a lot more than anything we can to change the composition of the future professoriate. The central question remains whether a more integrated Eurasian academic uh, environment can attract, rather than command, the buy-in from classicists, or for that matter, scholars in other neighboring disciplines that is needed to make this vision a reality. Can scholars rooted in existing disciplines continue to do work respected in their home fields while at the same time collaborating across the boundaries of those fields? Can graduate students trained in such an environment emerge with a good, scent, a good base in a discipline and at the same time be bearers of a broader outlook? As I look at the experience of the ISAW faculty and students over the past decade, it seems to me that the insider's perspective is decidedly affirmative. The amount of collaborative teaching has been especially great and a lot of fun. Students do still take most of their coursework inside their disciplines, but far from all, and required core courses impose some broadening of perspectives. I'm still publishing Papyri and Ostraca. Uh, and none of our faculty have left, except me for retirement. Some of our colleagues in downtown departments and at the IFA have become active parts of ISAW, teaching seminars for us, serving on exam and dissertation committees, spending terms as visiting research scholars, and collaborating on conferences. Others have not. And in this lies the challenge of showing that this sort of organization can help lead a move toward a more integrated study of antiquity at the larger institutional level. Two of the founding decisions about ISAW are, despite their significant good sides, obstacles in this respect. Our location, away from the main campus, and the fact that no faculty appointments are shared. As both of these impose financial costs as well as other structural difficulties, they are not likely to be replicated elsewhere. For this reason, I am cautiously optimistic that experiments elsewhere will indeed lead to the kind of broader study of Eurasian antiquity that Quinn calls for, but without giving up a sense of classics as a discipline in the process. Thank you. <laughs>